Today's episode of The Anthony Anderson Show is brought to you by MountGox.com. That's M-T-G-O-X.com. And USGoldCoins.com. 1-800-HOT-COIN. And MeziGrill.com. That's M-E-Z-E-G-R-I-L-L.com. Greetings, everyone. This is Anthony coming at you live from New York City. It's August 6, 2011. Mercury is in retrograde, and things are a little wacky. So uh, but we're... Uh, holding down the fort. Got a lot of stuff to talk about today. Don't have any guests in the studio. It's just going to be me talking about some things, some stuff that I've been up to. Uh, I got a really good email question and I want to you know, cover that. So we're just going to kind of go with the flow. This show might not even go for the full hour. It might even go to like 40, 45 minutes as well. So at first I want to, I want to talk about my, um, my little bag of tricks. And a lot of people kind of ask me about, you know, with the modeling stuff and what kind of things I like to bring along with me to the castings. And this is like a kind of a good overall thing that I like to have with me no matter what because it's like kind of hot right now and I'm sweating. And, and so I have my little bag, just like this, and it says Beauty Fix on it. And I didn't, you know, whatever. <laughs> and uh, what I like to really bring is um, we found this deodorant called Crystal Essence. And they're not um, affiliated with me in any ways, but we tried this out. And it's actually a lavender and white tea mineral deodorant body spray. And it's really nice. And there's no aluminum chlorohydrate in it, which is really good. And it's paraben free. Um, a funny thing about parabens is that I went to Deb and I from Debbie Does Raw. We were in Los Angeles and we went to the Lush Soap Company and they have parabens in their soap but they said that these parabens are derived from blueberries and not from chemicals or something. So look into that. Maybe Google parabens, methyl parabens, and blueberries and see if there is a connection because I was really surprised. I always thought parabens were just these chemi nasty things, not really cool. Um, just today we got this one. It's called Natural Liquid Rock and it is a paraben-free deodorant and it's from Kiss My Face. And this one seems to be really nice. I mean. Uh, it's got water, potassium alum, which I'm wondering if that's aluminum. I wouldn't think so, but some other things. There's willow bark extract, uh, some kind of lichen, sodium phytate, a couple other things. No big deal. A little toothpaste. You always want to have some toothpaste on you. This is from a company called uh, Himalaya. It's a neem pomegranate one. Really cool. My little mini toothbrush. Floss. I have some Tom's deodorant. This stuff isn't as strong, I think. I feel like the Crystal Essence has been treating me far better than that. A little sunscreen, Dr. H's sunscreen, really cool. A tongue scraper, really important. When you wake up in the morning and there's that white film on your tongue, from what I understand, that's actually toxins being expelled by your body and it film, makes a little film right on the upper layer of your tongue. And if you just kind of go about your day and swallow that stuff again, it's going right back into your system. So give it a little scrape and wash that stuff out and you would be amazed how good it is for preventing halitosis, which means stanky breath. And I think a big part about bad breath is that people don't floss and little bits of teeth get stuck in the back. You can always tell when you're talking to somebody if they don't floss, you can kind of smell it. A little portable razor. Sometimes I bring my beard trimmer with me, but that's not too important. A little eyeglass case and then I always like to bring a little mint oil or some kind of clove oil. This is Chef Ito's Love Potion Number no. 9, if I'm not mistaken. And I was in California about a month ago, and we went to a lock, and um, he got this for me. And uh, it's just like 50 ingredients. Two little drops will do ya. It's super heating. It's supposed to be good for like getting the blood flowing, all the you know, keeping the boys and girls happy. My favorite cologne, wow, it's really strong. At the moment, and actually for a long time, is the Te Ver from La Citani. And a lot of people would, I think they want to pronounce it Lactane, but I think it's actually La Citani. And um, it's a really, really nice scent. It's fresh, whatever. So this is like my little bag of goodies. So when I go up in the elevator for a casting, I'll get ready maybe bring like another shirt with me and that way I'm not sweating because you know I've got like a lot of appointments during the daytime and freshen up and then you're good to go. A little mint oil would also be nice but this um, Love Potion number no. 9 has really been treating me well. I got a really great email about chickens 
and um, she was asking me uh, some stuff, like she's thinking about getting chickens and what she wants to, um, she's kind of confused about things, you know, how to start. And I just want to pull this up because she asked a lot of really awesome questions that I think we would all seriously benefit from. Let me read this out really quick and then we'll just kind of break it down and answer the questions. Uh, hi Anthony, I'm looking into getting a couple of baby chickens. Which breed do you recommend in terms of brown egg layers and rainbow egg layers? And I think by rainbow egg layer she means the Easter egg kind which lay the pastel light green light blue eggs. It, it, is it true that hens don't need roosters to lay eggs? Anything in particular to look for, shots, etc., when buying these chickens? For deep orange yolks, what do you feed your hens and chicks? Is there any material that you recommend reading concerning how to care for chickens before I purchase them? Sorry for all the questions. I just want to be well prepared. Thank you for your time, Francine. And I haven't even replied yet. I just got this a little while ago, but this is a lot of really good questions. So check this out. Which breed do you recommend in terms of brown egg layers and rainbow egg layers? Brown egg layers, as far as I can tell, the, the best ones to get would be Rhode Island Reds or Black Sex Links. Black Sex Links are, they're kind of a combination with a Rhode Island Red and maybe another bird, another, obviously another chicken. But my favorites for sure, as far as brown egg layers, are the Rhode Island Reds because they're, they're a very hardy bird and they're a very low maintenance bird. Like you can tell they're reptilian, they're little dinosaurs, they, they do their thing they're very focused, they, you know, they, they'll, they'll attack bugs and they'll attack lizards and scorpions and, and whatever else they can find. And it just seems like you could let them be and then that, that they would be able to fend for themselves. And they're a nice meaty bird, so if you're looking for an all-purpose bird, which means egg layers and then possibly for eating as well, eating their bodies, ah! and not eating the eggs, but eating the actual bodies, that would probably be a Rhode Island Red because they put on a lot of weight pretty fast, but it's not like a Cornish Rock Hen, which is a total hybrid mutant from the factory farm industry. Those put on enough weight in two months alone to be ready for slaughter. On the other hand, maybe it'll take a Rhode Island Red maybe three months, maybe even four months, but you have a much healthier bird. It's a free range bird usually, I would hope. And it's just gonna be able to, cause let's say you have, you have a hen and she lays a bunch of eggs. And we'll get back to the rooster part in a second, but you have males and you have females. So by about two months, three months, four months, you can kind of tell who are your cockerels and who are your pullets. And a cockerel is a baby rooster and a pullet is a baby hen. And a really good way to check that is to take a little, like a playing card, you know, like the 52 deck playing card slide it right by their neck and underneath their first layer of feathers. And if the feathers are rounded, it's gonna be a hen. And if they're more pointy, they're gonna be a rooster. And that way you can sex them. And then that way you know which ones go into the pot and which ones are for your egg layers later on. It's a really good idea. I got that from a show called River Cottage. And you can find that on channel four in the UK. River Cottage is probably the, one of the best shows pertaining to holistic living, um, making your own food, raising your own food, living this kind of lifestyle that I'm a big fan of. River Cottage inspired me massively. Hugh Fernley Wittenstall is a genius. Is it true that hens don't need roosters to lay eggs? It is true, they do not need roosters. Roosters, roosters will fertilize these eggs, so you're gonna have baby chickens. But um, I think another part of it, roosters, they're very loud. Roosters are very aggressive with their hens where they'll beat up on the hens to keep them in line. And if you try and introduce a new hen into the flock, not only does that poor hen have to compete with the other females, but then she has to compete with this rooster. And I've seen roosters like tearing feathers out and just being really aggressive. So I'm not really, I'm not honestly a big fan about having roosters around. I don't think the protection is really all that worth it they will kind of do their thing and protect and you can walk up to a rooster and they'll start to kind of attack you and you have to have a little stick and kind of push them away and those things might come in handy but overall I think with the noise and the and the aggression that they put out I just don't think it's worth it so if you want to have more babies you can just buy fertile eggs from a friend and then put them underneath a broody hen and a broody hen is a hen that has 
she's become a mom in her mind. So all she wants to do is sit on eggs and she will leave her clutch of eggs to go get some food and get some water and otherwise she's right back on that clutch and she's waiting for that month to pass until she hatches. So what you can do is you can slip underneath her some fertile eggs. She's gonna think that they're hers, they're gonna hatch, she's gonna raise them, she's gonna protect them and then you're gonna get your half and half batch of males and females one half is gonna be the males, you're gonna probably eat them. The other half is gonna be females and you're gonna save them or maybe sell them off because they're gonna be laying really awesome eggs. Overall, with permaculture and all this stuff, chickens are probably one of the best animals to raise because not only are they giving you good quality nutrients in their fertilizer, which means their poop, but you can, let's say like, okay, I wanna go and do some wild harvesting. And there's only so much stuff that I can eat without a lot of processing. But with the chickens, I can just be cutting grass in the alleyways. I can be, you know, whatever. I can find some landscapers and get big bags of grass and just dump that all over the place and they can just eat it. And those types of things really make it a lot easier to feed them and, and you don't have to worry so much. And you're just gonna get better quality, better quality meat, eggs. You're gonna get better quality, you know, fertilizer as well funnel and your, your your whole neighborhood is going into these chickens and then they eat it and then they you know comes out in the form of eggs that you eat or poop that you use to fertilize your garden so it's really really good i mean even compared to i mean if rabbits laid eggs that would be awesome if goats you know laid eggs goats you have to milk twice a day usually so that's a lot more work it's a lot more intensive time just kind of keeping keeping tabs and everything and they're very they can be very destructive chickens can be destructive too but you really have to realize that they're a tool but they can be a tool that can get out of hand so you want to kind of fence them in and i'm all about pastured and free range but if you can set them up in movable pens so they can keep doing their thing and eating grass they have to eat grass and they have to eat leafy greens if you're going to get good yolks but letting them go totally free range is kind of an idealistic idea because you want them to be totally all over the place, but then you realize that they're pooping on your lawn furniture and they're pooping on your barbecue and, and it's not as romantic as you think. So it's kind of good to have them structured. They're kind of like kids where they need a little bit of structure. Um, anything in particular to look for, shots, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know if they actually Im um, give vaccines to baby chicks. I hope not, I don't think they do. And I wouldn't even want that. I feel when chickens eat a healthy diet, it's just like humans. If you eat a, a healthy diet loaded in minerals and omega-3s, you just don't get sick. You know, you don't need vaccines. Vaccines are for people that, one, believe all that nonsense, and two, are sick people, you know, and they need the vaccines and their immune systems are down and, you know, needing the vaccines is almost an illusion in my mind, but if you're eating a healthy diet, all that stuff just becomes irrelevant. All the doctors, all the, you know, all the hospital, the nonsense, the insurance, you just don't get sick anymore. And it's the same way with animals. You feed them correctly, you don't get sick. I haven't been sick in eight years since I've been eating a whole foods diet with real food and not processed. It's, it's just like, it's a no brainer. And I think that's why it's so obvious that we're fed all this garbage because it makes us sick. Anything, da, 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 da. so it, yeah, you don't want vaccines at all. And you wanna make sure that they're not eating soybeans. When you buy their feed, look for the soybeans. You wanna give them organic feed. Um, you don't want soybeans in there. You can actually buy a big bag of wheat or a big bag of, of you know, organic shelled corn or sunflower seeds. And then um, you can sprout it or whatever. And then you can also just let them go free range and you really don't have to spend that much on food. If you're in a small contained area, you might have to import a lot of food, but you can actually do that with vegetable scraps. And I highly recommend feeding chickens like fish, feeding them other, not chickens, but feeding them like roadkill and meat and just a lot of nasty stuff because that's what they like to eat and that's where all the nutrients are. And they say that a chicken and a hawk will eat the same exact diet, but if they're sitting together at the same table, the hawk's gonna eat the chicken, but they're eating all the same stuff. So remember that, they're, they'll, they'll eat a dead rabbit, they'll eat mouse, they'll eat scorpion, they'll eat anything, really. They'll eat dog poop. I mean, chickens are crazy, so don't worry about all that kind of stuff. For the deep orange yolks, what do you feed your hens or chicks? You have to feed them leafy greens or grass. 
there has to be all the vitamin A, the beta carotene, and then that's gonna show in the yolks. When I was living in Arizona, I would go drive around and I would cut grass from the alleyways. And it took about four to five days, maybe even a week to start seeing the real deep change. And then they would eat all that grass. I'd have to go back to California and do some stuff with castings and stuff in, in Los Angeles. And then I'd come back two weeks later and the yolks would be yellow again. They'd be pale yellow because they're just eating the organic feed. They're not eating, and maybe they're eating bugs too, but they need to be eating leafy greens, veggie scraps, yeah, unless there's piles and piles of spinach for your veggie scraps or whatever, it's not gonna show. They need to eat big bags of grass and big bags of leaves, and that could be like mesquite leaves, that could be anything, but they need to get the greens inside them if you hope to get the, the orange yolks. It's almost like the same if you're eating tons of spirulina or tons of foods with beta carotene, your, the palms of your hands will start to turn orange. And almost like the area around your mouth will turn orange and the bottom of your feet will turn orange. That's the vitamin A coming out of your body because it's almost overloaded. It's the same idea, you want the vitamin A coming out of, of the yolks. And what's perfect about eating the eggs is that it comes in a fat soluble package because the yolk has fat in it full of omega-3 fatty acids and that way you can absorb the vitamin A. If you're drinking tons of green juice with no fat in it, that vitamin A is gonna go right through your body. It's not gonna get absorbed because vitamin A is a fat soluble vitamin and you need to package it with fat. So stir in a little bit of coconut milk, a little coconut oil, whatever it takes, even take a few spoonfuls of coconut oil and then drink your green juice, whatever it takes, but you need to mix it with fat if you hope to absorb the vitamin A. Is there any material that you recommend reading concerning how to care for your chickens before I purchase them? Um, we really jumped uh, head first right in and it's just kind of like common sense. There's a website called Backyard Chicken Breeder or Backyard Chickens, mychicken.com. Just go online, you really don't even need any books. There's lots of forums. Go to permies.com, that's P-E-R-M-I-E-S, permies.com. Look on their chicken section and see what Paul Wheaton is talking about because he has a really good chicken system set up kind of based off of Sepp Holzer's um, ideas. Sepp Holzer is a permaculturist in, in Switzerland. I was gonna say Austria, but it's Switzerland. Check out Permies. You don't even have to buy a book. I mean, the only book that I would really recommend reading, a few of them, would be Gaia's Garden and then Edible Forest Gardens, Volume 1 and 2, and maybe some stuff by Bill Mollison. There's a lot of good books out there that are going to teach you a lot, but if you want to cut to the bone, rubber to the road, just go online, permies.com. Thanks so much for the questions. I just want to be well prepared. Thank you for your time. That's the thing with chickens. It's like, it's almost nicer with animals compared to plants because the animals will give you direct feedback pretty fast. And if you just have, if you're gonna get chickens, you can start with hens. They're probably gonna cost about $3 a piece, maybe $2.50. I would also get, oh, sorry, I didn't cover this about the brown egg layers. As well, the rainbow egg layers, look for the arucanas and the americanas. And they're the ones with little puffy cheeks and little, little tufts coming out. And they might be white, they might be gold. Uh, we have one, Prudence, um, her name is Prudence, um, she's in Phoenix, I haven't seen her since March, but um, beautiful chickens, beautiful chickens. An interesting thing to think about is a lot of people freak out about coyotes and hawks and predators, and as far as I know, there were three chickens that died in, Ar in Arizona, and it, one was because she was egg bound, and she was a... Leghorn, one of the white ones with the red, with the red um, beard kind of thing going on. I don't even know the name of it. It shows how out of it I am right now. She got egg bound where the egg got stuck in her. And then like the, the stuff was coming out, like she was pushing, it looked like she had really bad hemorrhoids. It was horrible. And tried to nurse her for the, for the night and it just didn't work out. And we ended up having to take her out of her pain because she was really in a bad spot. And then the other two were actually suffocated by their sisters because they all wanted to lay eggs in the same box. And there would be four stacked on top of each other trying to lay an egg. And then the one on the bottom would either die of asphyxi asphyxiation or heat exhaustion or something, but then they would be dead. Chickens are not the most intelligent animals on the planet. Don't let Disney humanize them for you because uh, 
they're definitely reptilian and they are very basic minded. They have motherly instincts, but really they, they'll suffocate their sisters because they don't even know, you know, and, and they'll just like beat up on each other and peck at each other. And it's, it's really kind of romanticized, but they are, they're wonderful birds. You can pet them. They are very calm and usually pretty docile if you raise them as a chick. But what I would almost suggest is probably just going on Craigslist and buying some hens for $10 or $12. And then just cutting right to the chase because you have to think, you're gonna raise them for about five to six months before you see your first egg. And then how much food is that gonna cost? Is it gonna cost more than $10 in food? I would think so. To keep a chicken alive for six months is gonna cost you more than $10. So you might consider just buying some adult hens and getting on with it instead of all the fuss. A lot of people like to raise the chicks and be that you know do all that kind of stuff. In my mind, it's a, it's kind of a lot of work, and you should just cut the crap and just go for it. Buy the adult hens, get them all together, and start getting your eggs going because it doesn't make any sense to feed chicks for six months waiting for eggs. And then once they're once they're producing and that you know you can put some fertile eggs underneath, then you can have your chicks. And then the mother hen is gonna raise the chicks for you. You don't have to keep them near a heat lamp and, and make sure that they're walking. Just, it's a lot of headaches. And if you're busy, it's very, uh, just go with the adults. You know, It's kind of fun to have the chicks, but in reality, go with the, go with the adults. Uh, as far as, as far, what else I can tell with the chickens, really make sure they are protected just in case because you might have a busy area. The hens will make some noise in the morning when they're laying their eggs, but otherwise they're pretty quiet and they don't like to wander around too much. They'll be free range, but they don't, they're not gonna like fly into the other yard or it, they never even went out into the street as far as I remembered. And then I was just like harvesting prickly pear cactus and they're just like chomping on that stuff and get, you know, they can just eat stuff that we can't eat. And then they can grind up all the seeds in, in their gizzard and it's really like an awesome thing. So let me know if you have any questions about that. Even shoot me an email at anthony at rawmodel.com or hopefully that answered a lot of questions. But really just go to permies.com and they have their forums and they talk about all kinds of um, livestock, pigs, chickens, goats, guinea hens, pheasants. You might even want to get some pheasants because they lay those pretty brown eggs and they're not going to be as productive. If you could choose anything, I would probably go with ducks because ducks are very quiet. They eat slugs. They won't scratch up a garden. You know, if you plant some fruit trees and then you throw chickens around everywhere, they're going to start scratching up the fruit trees and eating, eating the worms around your fruit trees and they're going to start messing things up. Ducks, on the other hand, are just gonna kind of, you know, waddle around and do their thing, and it's not gonna be so intense. And then plus, their eggs are usually far richer, and less people are allergic to duck eggs than to chicken eggs. Pretty cool. So let me know. Whatever, it's all good. On that note, or not on that note, we can talk about a little bit of spring water. Uh, we went to Cold Spring Harbor about two weeks ago, myself and my friend Matt Mueller. And we drove out there from Brooklyn, and I think it took about 45 minutes to maybe an hour, and you go out to this area called Cold Spring Harbor. It's near Oyster Bay, and there's actually a really cool arboretum in Oyster Bay. And Cold Spring Harbor, the, the spring is actually right across from the library. And check it out on findaspring.com. Findaspring.com. That's Daniel Vitalis' site along with, uh, uh, God, I'm like blanking out here. <laughs> Uh, Raw Food Right Now, Heidi and JS, and they all started that site, along with Drew Mill, who's actually having a birthday today. Happy birthday, Drew Mill, very cool buddy, 29 years old, going strong. He's uh, Drew Mill of The Clean Program. I'm sure a lot of you know The Clean Program. They all started findaspring.com, and findaspring.com is just a, it's a directory of all these springs across the world that you can go and actually harvest your own spring water. And this water is actually from Cold Spring Harbor. And what I really love about spring water is that it's, um, it's always tested. Usually it's never a mystery. There's always locals that live in this area and they've been drinking wa this water for decades. And they know that it's clean and even like the, the city or the state will test it occasionally. So you really don't have to worry about any poisoning. The coolest thing is that it has been underground for possibly hundreds if not thousands of years. So this is pre-industrial water. Like this water was sitting in an underground lake two weeks ago. And this was before pollution was invented, invented. This was before radiation, nuclear fallout, 
all that nonsense that humans decided to bring to the planet, this water predates that. So this is the cleanest thing that I'm ever gonna find on planet Earth. And like Daniel Vitale said, it's the cleanest thing and you get to put it in your body every single day and it becomes your blood. Like the water that you drink now will become your blood. So that's a really huge idea to think from. We're always thinking about like, oh, the food, the food, the supplements, the food, what kind of chompy stuff are we gonna be eating? Not really giving much credit to the water, but knowing that our bodies are 75 to 80% water, it's a really big part of the game. So what are you making your body with? If that, what, where does that 75, 80% coming from? Is it coming from the tap? Is it coming from a, you know, something in a bottle, like this originally was a Poland spring bottle, and how long was this bottle of water sitting on the shelf? You know, maybe like six months, or maybe, I don't even know if there's even like a date on it, sometimes they don't even tell you. It actually says drink by February 24th, 2012. So just think of how long this water has to kind of start to leach away at this plastic, and now that it's like fresh in there, fresh out of the ground, super structured, the TDS is like 30 or 45, it's really low, it's been distilled by the planet, it's been filtered by the planet, it's been incubating, sitting underneath the ground for a long, long time. And when you drink it, you just know how velvety and silky it is, and that just lets you know like really how pure I feel. I mean, it's just some of the, the cleanest water that I've ever had. And for the cost of some gasoline and a day trip, it's yours for free. So you don't even have to buy water anymore. And that's, I mean, really that's why I love like Daniel Vital so much is that bringing findaspring.com, Heidi and JS too, of course, but it's such a great free resource that I've basically eliminated my water cost. And I don't even have to worry about filtration anymore. That's really the key. And it's like, it's the same thing with wild, wild food. Like this is wild water. So wild food, wild water, it's actually the best possible form of nourishment that you can get, and usually it's free if you're willing to invest the time and energy into harvesting it yourself. So not only is it therapeutic to be eating foods and drinking water like that, but it's totally therapeutic to be going out into nature and with your own hands, harvesting your own water and bringing it home with you. And then we'll just drink that for the month. We'll get like a one month supply. It'll probably cost $20 in gasoline. Maybe three or four of us will go out there. We'll go for a hike, maybe go to the Whole Foods out there, go to the Arboretum. And we just got like a, an awesome, stash of the best possible water that I couldn't even buy if I wanted to because no one offers it. Even like Fiji water or Voss or Iceland, all these good ones that I would actually really like, they're, they have to be cooked, they have to be sterilized because if not, you know, things are gonna start forming in that water because there's natural things in the water that are still alive, it's living water. So they have to cook it, so you're drinking cooked kind of dead water or it's going through a pipe and it's, it has to be chlorinated and they're always putting the fluoride in there and whatever else. I remember a story uh, coming from Texas, I think six months ago, that they were finding radiation. This was before um, Fukushima, but they were finding radiation in the water. And the big secret was that they were actually putting the radiation in the water. Check out infowars.com for that and Google Texas water radiation and see what you find because that was like a really messed up story and you just can't trust that stuff. So that's why I'm all about the spring water. You can do rainwater if you want to, but think about what's in the air right now. Think about if you can filter it out with like a Berkey filter, that would really be the only filter that I would recommend now is a Berkey filter. That's B-U-R-K-E-Y. And that was actually invented by British troops like a hundred years ago and they would filter swamp water through this thing and then it would, out would come pure water. So you could actually probably urinate in this stuff and then get pure water coming out of it. It's pretty, kind of a crazy idea, but that would be the only way I would really wanna drink rainwater now because I'm thinking radiation's up in the sky, whatever else, the exhaust, and that's coming down liquefied by the rain and it's just like not something that I really wanna deal with. I like the spring water. It's been protected for millennia and now you get to drink it. I mean. And really, once you drink it, and okay, another thing too, when I harvest spring water, I like to harvest it in these bottles called Better Bottles. And they're plastic, and it's like a non-leaching brewing bottle that they make for making wine and, and beer. And it's, uh, I think the no, it's the number one, maybe, 
and you can check out better-bottle.com. It's an option. What I like about that is that it's light and that it's not gonna break in the car because a lot of people, they get the big five gallon Mountain Valley spring bottles, but they're glass, then a lot of times people will break them. What you can do is when you go to nurseries and you buy plants, usually they come in these black buckets. And funny enough, a lot of these bottles will fit right inside these black buckets and you can like wrap a towel on the inside for extra padding and then that's like a secure little thing. Sometimes also I get these uh, half gallon glass bottles from Strauss Creamery and that's kind of a West Coast um, grass fed milk operation. These little half gallon glass and you put them in a milk milk case or a milk crate and I think it holds maybe six gallons because there's either 10 or 12 of these bottles and they just stack really nice and you only have to hold one bottle at a time just like this. This is a lot lighter than a five gallon jug and if I were to trip and fall on a big glass five gallon jug that thing could I could you know it would break and it could like cut a huge hole in my body and it's not something that you want to deal with especially now that fall's going to be coming, winter's coming, people are going to slip on ice try and go with the better bottles or go with smaller glass bottles and then get it into glass when you get home. If you, if you know it's gonna be a long-term storage thing, get it into the glass and then you're gonna be better than you know having it sit in plastic for a little while. Mm. Well, oh, the water's so good. Um, let's do a little, oh, let's talk about Mount Gox and our sponsors. Mt. Gox, online exchange services for Bitcoins. They now take Euros, British Pounds, Australian Dollars, and now Canadian Dollars. There are continuing fees of 0.3% now through August 9th, which is coming up pretty fast, so act soon. And usgoldcoins.com, and that number is 1-800-HOT-COIN. Call the phone number if you want to talk to them. They're actually really good about customer service. You can probably talk directly to Andy Goss on the phone. He's a trusted advisor for investments in rare gold and silver coins. If you've been paying any attention this week to what's happening with the stock market and what's happening with gold and silver, it's going up like crazy. The stock market's going down, the dollar's going down. There's really no hope, in my opinion, in non-tangible assets. You have to think about stuff that you can hold physically in your hands and that you can put away in your home because the way the government's going, the way the government's growing, I just don't trust them in the upcoming years to not take everyone's assets. Sounds a little paranoid, but uh, their actions speak for themselves. So again, 1-800-HOTCOIN.COM. Sorry, 1-800-HOTCOIN. <laughs> and Mezzi Grill. Mezzi Grill authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor and they, they're now serving breakfast. They're on 8th Avenue at 55th Street in New York City. They are the first restaurant in the world to offer services that cater to Bitcoin customers. So if you have Bitcoins and you want to buy stuff with Bitcoins and want to buy some food with Bitcoins, go to Mezzi Grill. And they're just a couple blocks south of Columbus Circle and they're now on the NYC Clean Plates um, so that's great, you know, it's clean food. We wanna be eating clean food and I've had their food, it's awesome. They've got lamb, they've got veg vegetarian options. It's all primo stuff. So uh, let's talk about some events coming up. I'm doing a talk on August 11th at Organic Avenue and that's organicavenue.com. Check the events section. If you scroll over a little bit to your right, you'll see the events right there and then I should be on top now because it's coming up pretty soon. I'm gonna be giving a two and a half hour lecture workshop talk called A Model for Living. And that's kind of this blueprint formulation that I've made in the past, I would say eight years. I started getting into this holistic lifestyle in 2003, 2002 getting conscious about what I was eating, having to really step up my game for modeling, exercises that I've learned, books that I've read, things that I feel have really helped me along the path. This talk is all about condensing those eight years of struggles and triumphs and trials and tribulations into this really great condensed two and a half hour lecture. And we're gonna be doing some guided meditations. I wanna be giving away a lot of samples from uh, Amazon Herb Company. I recently joined teams with them and they sent me a bunch of stuff that I'm supposed to sell, but I just wanna actually give it away to people and get them excited about these products. And I really believe in this company. They're doing some amazing stuff with reforesting the Amazon and 
in, in empowering indigenous cultures and, and tribes down there to really um, support the forest and not feel like they have to cut it down and grow soybeans and GMO corn or even sugarcane. You know, like Brazil talks so big about how they're powering all these cars on sugarcane, but these fields used to be Amazonian rainforest so people can drive around in their cars. I don't really see what's so awesome about that. So the trick is to show everyone that there is an intrinsic value, there's an economic value. If people are so obsessed with money and all that kind of stuff, they're, they need to know that there's a value in an intact rainforest. There's Brazil nuts, I had Brazil nuts this morning, there's, which is a wild food. Brazil nuts, camu camu, uh, you know, chuchuhuasi, coca, maca, all, 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 you know, acerola, all these different really powerful superfoods, patiarco, cat's claw, ayahuasca, that's not for sale, but um, all these things are coming out of the Amazon and they're, they're very, very powerful foods coming from a magical place on the planet and people are cutting it down to grow soybeans, to feed cows or to feed humans, GMO soy. It's nonsense, we gotta stop that right now and the only way we're gonna do it is by playing the economic game and showing people that there's money involved. So that's the whole thing, Amazon Herb Company, I'm giving away a bunch of freebies. We're gonna be making samples. They've got a great rainforest tea that we're gonna be handing out. And I'm actually gonna be handing out some spring water samples too. So people can see how awesome spring water is and maybe I can encourage them to start going and buy, uh, not buying spring water, but harvesting their own spring water. I mean, if you're gonna buy some water, go for it. I mean, no matter what, you're probably gonna to have to because you're not gonna have it set up so you can keep doing the spring water day in, day out. But if you can, please try it. And that's what this event's about. I want people to try this stuff. I want people to kind of immerse themselves in my world and see what works, what doesn't. And I'm just kind of really tired about health gurus telling people what to eat and how to live and they just don't look like vibrant living people and they're supposed to be eating the best foods on the planet and I don't know, you know, so I'm looking for people that are walking the walk, doing their thing, you know, super sharp, looking good, and that's what this talk's all about. It's like, I've had to really step up my game to make money in New York City as a model. It's really competitive. I mean, there's so many guys that look like me, and for me to be able to work, I really need to be in good shape, I need to be lean, I have to have clear eyes, I have to have good skin, I, my hair has to be good, my nails have to be healthy, and that's where all this real whole food, raw food, all came into play, and the exercise stuff, and I had to de determine a way to stay active with exercises. So in about like two minutes, we're gonna start doing a few exercises that I learned, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this very extensively during the talk, but I wanna show you maybe like two or three quick things so everyone at home, you know, I wanna make sure this is really spreading far and wide so you can really enable yourself to stay consistent because that's the key. I don't really care what someone's technique is. I don't care if they're doing this or this or whatever, you know. I just wanna know how long they've been doing it because really the people that you see at the gym and they've got the results, they've been just doing it and they know how to do it and they know how to give a little extra. They know how to give 100% and they're making it fun, obviously, or they're motivated enough to keep going back to the gym. Because with me, it was like the financial motivation. I knew like if I was gonna make a bunch of money, I had to, a bunch of money, that's all relative, I had to stay you know, really in good shape. So I was finding out ways to multitask and listen to things. So I started listening to audiobooks and I started listening to podcasts and interviews and, and good music and Spanish lessons and French lessons. And, and by doing that, I was able to develop my mind as well as develop my body. And I knew like, oh, you get this, one of the best websites you can check out is oneradionetwork.com. And that's Patrick Timpone's site. Uh, Andy Goss is on there twice a week talking about money, but his interviews are usually one and a half to two hours long. And then I'll just sit in my chair and listen to, listen to Patrick talk and I'll just do little crunches like this. Or I'll do bicycles, just like that. And I'm just listening to an interview. And I can put my hands on my head, I can do this and this, I can twist my torso. It's all good, you know, it's not like a big deal. And you start listening to those interviews, you start speeding up your evolution, you start getting, you broadening your horizons. You know, like I was just in the raw vegan paradigm for about four or five years. And then I started listening to one radio network and I was hearing people from like the primal scene and the Weston Price scene. And 
maybe like the fruitarian scene. And there's just like so many little, little cliques and, and groups and like macrobiotics and we can kind of forget that there's so many other people out there. So right now I'm really kind of doing the Weston Price paleo stuff and it's really working for me. It's definitely a higher fat diet for me. I know last week I had the fruitarians from 30 bananas a day, Harley and Freely, and they are huge fans of fruit and low fat. Uh, on the other hand, for me, I've really found a lot of success with high fat. So, and not, not even worrying about protein so much, but more about the fat. And I just feel more satisfied and I don't have to eat 30 damn bananas a day. You know what I mean? And, but that's the whole thing about this show is I like to bring a lot of cool people on and they can sh share their stories, share their results. They're both in good shape, obviously. And then we go from there. You know, people can decide for themselves. I'm really not trying to tell you what to do. I just want to give you a bunch of good ideas and then you can just pick and choose like a buffet. Old, you know, like, what's that one? Old, no, old Town Buffet or something. Remember back in the day, like Old Town Buffet? And you can just kind of see what you like. It's like a cafeteria, you know? It's like, okay, I'm gonna, I like this. I like the greens here, but I don't like so many nuts. And uh, da da da, or like I'm gonna, I wanna work out like this, I wanna do some cardio, but I don't wanna do weight bearing exercises, or I don't wanna do, or I wanna do body weight exercises and not maybe dumbbells. And that's just the way it is. So I just wanna bring a lot of people in, and then you can pick and choose what you like. Easy enough. So let's do a couple exercises here. I'm gonna show you a few things that I've, I've been doing lately. And this is a nice one that you can do in a very tight area. And again, put on the computer, listen to some interviews, do some podcasts, and you're gonna be all set. It's gonna be really, really fun. So, this is looking good. Okay, great. <laughs> what I like to do, I'll do a little side view like this. I can kind of, I'm seeing in the, mirror, in the mirror here. It's a push-up sit-up combo. So you're gonna be working your abs and then sit-ups, and you're gonna be working your chest as well. And also with push-ups, you're gonna be working your triceps. So what I like to do, and I'm gonna shorten this a little bit because I wanna, you know, usually I would go till exhaustion, till muscle failure, but I just wanna show you a quick little thing. I do usually 10 push-ups like this, and you can start just kind of like straight below your shoulders, no big deal. I'll do 10, or maybe I'll do 20. I think at home it would almost be better to do 20, and just really kind of going slow and focusing on every single muscle, and then when, you can't do any more. That's the key. Don't even worry about a number. Just do it until you can't do any more. Flip over, flip over, and then do some crunches. So I like to put my knees up, and then I'll do my crunches. Boom. And I'll maybe hold it for five seconds. And I'll do that until it's really hurting, you know? It's just like, okay, it's about time to flip over again. Not feeling so hot anymore, feeling kind of sore. I'll flip over. And it's nice, like in a very small area, right? A flip over, and I'm gonna do diamond cutter push-ups this time. And this is when you make, you know, this kind of shape. If some people would think it's like the, the Jay-Z Illuminati thing, but that's definitely not my, my scene. So, um, almost think of it as an upside down heart. And then I just like to go, bum, bum. and this is really working my, my lower chest. Because a lot of guys, they'll have good upper chest, but you wanna work your lower chest. And then really just squeeze it out. Just squeeze it out and go nice and slow. And then when you almost can't do any more, just hover. Just really hover and keep it going. Just, uh, you know, like, <laughs> breathe, 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 and then flip again. And then you just keep doing this pattern. And then this time, I'm gonna do a leg raise. So I'm gonna work my lower abs. Boom, boom, really nice. You know, this is in a small area. It's efficient while my chest muscles rest. I'm working my ab muscles. So it's really like a nice quick kind of thing. When you're at the gym and you're, you're doing your thing and then you just kind of chill for, for your minute and you're like, hmm, okay, I just kind of wait and wait until do the, the next exercise. In the meantime, you could be working out. You could be stretching. You could be stretching your neck. You could be, you know, rolling your shoulders around, doing something. So we'll flip over again. Another one too, go super wide. You can do that. Another one where you don't even have to flip between abs and, and chest is I'll do this, I'll do these push-ups, and then I'll go like this and make kind of a tripod and just hover. And then I'll just kind of bring my butt up in the air and just really keep my core flexed. And you can go on your side. Boom, see how, if you can kind of see how that's working. 
So it's really, I can do my obliques, I can do whatever, and I really don't even have to flip. And then as soon as I'm getting really sore, I just go right back into push-ups. Boom, just knock out a couple. I can't really do, can't really do one hand, it's too much right now. You can spread your legs, whatever you need to do. You can put your feet up in the air. Oh, another thing I like to do is put one foot in the air like this and even bring, bring that foot up to your chest. And then that way, boom. I mean, bring your knee to your chest, boom. So you're doing abs and chest at the same time. So that's really the key. It's like making it fast, making it consistent. Cause again, like I really, you know, that's a good method I'm doing and that's a good thing to know. But overall it's the people that have the results are the ones that just go a lot and the ones that are consistent. Really consistency gets the goods. It's all about sticking to the curriculum and not getting distracted and bogged down. And you know, you go to the gym January, January 2nd, January 3rd, the gym is loaded with people that are doing their new year's resolutions and they're, you know, kicking butt or whatever. And, and then by about February, March, you just don't see anyone there anymore because they get tired of it because in their mind, exercise is work. Exercise is homework. But if they were to listen to some good music, you know, whatever, have a, maybe have a little coffee beforehand, just something to kind of pep them up, listen to, you know, whatever, you know, I mentioned it before, listen to some interviews. That way maybe it would be a little more enjoyable and they would, you would see them in June, you would see them in August and you'd see them right before Christmas holiday. So don't really worry about technique so much, worry more about how to make it fun. So I'm gonna really get back into, get back into all that stuff, um, not get back into it, I'm gonna talk about it at the event for Organic Avenue in I believe five days. And I'm gonna be doing a lot more, doing some shoulder stuff as well. Like here's another one. I'm sitting on a chair right now. I'm getting all sweaty. I can just sit here and go like this. Mm -mm. Watching TV, watching the news, getting brainwashed, you know, all that good stuff. Getting depressed, <laughs> that acidic CNN.com, whatever. And, uh, and I can do some shoulder stuff like this. Even just stretching, you know, flexibility is a huge part of the game and it's gonna make your muscles build, I think, because and you're, get, you're like getting them stretched out and they're healing and, and you can just sit and watch some TV. It's really, multitasking is a lot easier than you think and if you have a rebounder per se, if you have a rebounder, you can just stand in front of it and just bounce and watch TV, put on some Netflix, I'm a big fan of Netflix. I like Hulu.com. I watch a lot of YouTube. There were some great Terrence McKenna videos on YouTube recently. Google him, Terrence McKenna. He's an ethnobotanist and he actually passed away about 10 years ago. It's T-E-R-E-N-C-E. -E. There might be two R's in there. McKenna, M-C-K-E-N-N-A, Terrence McKenna, a genius. He wrote the book Foods of the Gods or Food of the Gods. Yeah, foods of the gods, really awesome stuff. So like, I'll just put on some of those, some of his talks and just do some, you know, boom, boom, work out my abs like this. You know, I'll just kind of stand here and just do stuff like this. And how hard is that, you know? Boom, 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 boom. Easy, easy, easy. And that way I'm able to stay consistent and I'm getting my workouts in. Another thing too, get this, I don't like to structure my exercise hour. Like I'm, I'm okay, I'm gonna exercise, blah, blah, blah. I like to maybe, if I've got 10 minutes, I'll just do what I just showed you on the floor there and just crank out the, 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 the chest and the stomach. And then maybe like later on today, I might have like a spare 15 and then I'll, get, I'll do my, uh, my bicep curls or I'll do some pull-ups. You know, pull-ups are a great one. Who do you know that does pull-ups? Probably nobody. People really don't do them on a regular basis, but just imagine if you did, you'd get that, those nice muscles down in your back, you know, like really good, like good arms. I mean, pull-ups will do everything. And when you do a pull-up, you can bring your knees up and just hold it. I'm really all about the isometrics, just holding the, holding the position and really making the muscles struggle because that's where you're gonna see the challenges and then that's where you're gonna see the growth. It's just like life. If there's no challenge, there's no growth. And I think that's why so many kids these days 
Here's my little side tangent. That's why so many kids these days are marshmallows because both figuratively and literally, because there's never been any challenges in their lives. Parents want to make life easy. They want to make life, you know, as oh, just like whatever, you know, like easy for their kids. Very, very, you know, I'm not saying nepotism, but in that, in that kind of realm, like giving them things and, you know, paying for college and, and whatever, you know, paying for the car, paying for the insurance. And then these kids have to enter the real world at age 22, 23, maybe later if they go for an MBA or a doctorate or something. And they're total marshmallows with no, with no work ethic. You don't think about that. So really you have to challenge yourself and there has to be growth. And if not, you know, look what, look what we're going. We, I mean, as a, as a country, we have to compete with China, India, you know what I mean? Like these things are really, um, really coming to a forefront now. So we really have to enable ourselves and give ourselves some, some challenges so we can grow and be stronger. That's really how it is. I think that's, that's just about it. We're probably gonna wrap this up fairly soon. Uh, again, I just wanna mention the event at Organic Avenue, and that's gonna be August 11th, 2011, at six o'clock. I believe it's six o'clock. I don't think it's 6.30. It's six to 8.30. And then, um, I'm just going to be really just the whole thing. I'm going to be talking about permaculture, building food forests, um, f yeah, the forest gardens, why urban permaculture, going to be talking about the exercises, of course, going to be talking about green lifestyle strategies, such as harvesting the water, you know, shower filters, recycling, home composting, vermicomposting, all of these sorts of ideas that we can incorporate into our lives, both to save us money do our part to not be a part of the problem. That's a big part. I'm not gonna say that you recycling in your house is gonna save the earth, but it's gonna feel good not to be a part of that problem, that's for sure. And then you're gonna be doing better stuff for your health. The less packaging you have, the less processed food you're eating, it, it all really kind of um, serves itself. It's really an amazing thing. And then I'm gonna be doing some guided meditations. So let's just finish it out with a guided meditation. Uh, they're going to be doing like a little qigong stuff too and that's going to be really cool but uh let's just if you can if you want to you know i'm sitting here doing this um, if you feel like it i think you'll get a lot from it i just like to sit for maybe two minutes or three minutes and just take a few deep breaths and just kind of be present in your body like feel your hands you know your hands can be on your knees really concentrate on your breath and just imagine living on a paradise planet Imagine living in a forest garden and your kids or your, or your nephews, or your grandchildren, or your nieces and your cousins, every, little kids just running around picking berries and you know, like har harvesting honey and, and you know, expand that vision to like neighborhoods just covered in fruit and nut trees. And imagine just walking down the sidewalk and you see like grape arbors everywhere and, and raspberries and, and just like kiwi vines and, and walnut trees over everything. And, and then expand that even further where you're looking at the full city. So you go from like the backyard to the neighborhood to the city, you know, green. All you see is green when you fly over. Little houses nestled beneath, but you can't even see them because of the canopy. And then further out, you're at the country level, just covered, just covered in green again because we realize that growing GMOs and growing monocrops is insane. And it's a waste of money. It makes us sick and it makes us poor. So we're transferring over to a perennial polyculture instead of an annual monoculture. And because of that, we're healing the planet, it's expanding to the world. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing China covered in food forests, India covered in tropical food forests. We're seeing New Zealand, Australia, all the deserts of Australia being brought back to life. All the deserts of the Western US brought back to life. There's so much potential. I want, to, I want you to check out a video on YouTube called Greening the Desert. And this was a permaculture project by Jeff Lawton. Uh, and I believe they did it I wasn't sure if it was Syria or if it was in Palestine. I'm not sure, but check out Greening the Desert. I'm pretty sure it's Syria. Greening the Desert. And there's a part one and a part two. See what they did. They're getting figs, pomegranates, citrus, guavas, a lot of good stuff out of this area that was a salt flat. You know, and they thought that stuff would never grow there. They were lowering the water table, uh, getting the salt out, really, really amazing stuff. So check it out. 
And um, yeah, just envision yourself on a paradise planet and work towards that. Treat each other like sacred siblings. Know that you're uh, an enlightened soul on this planet and act like it for God's sake. So thank you so much. This is Anthony Anderson from The Anthony Anderson Show, onlyonetv.com. And thanks so much, guys, for tuning in. I hope you got a lot from the show, and we'll see you really soon next week. Take it easy. Peace.